Well, welcome uh, everybody and thank you for joining us at the end of a very busy uh, school day, I'm sure, as they all are. We appreciate you spending some time with us for this session, uh, Teach McCarthyism and its current relevance. Excuse me, I'm gonna turn off one of my um, applications so I don't get any pop-up windows here. This session is part of the NERC uh, 2020 virtual conference. It is being recorded. The recording link will be um, in the NERC archive. The NERC is the New England Regional um, Social Studies Conference, uh, part of the Massachusetts and New England Social Studies Associations, for, um, which I believe is a chapter of NS NCSS, actually. I hadn't thought about that, but I guess it is. Anyway, um, thank you for joining us. So my name is Carolyn Jacobs. I'm with the Education Department at GBH. And this session is sponsored by GBH out of Boston, which is Boston's PBS station. We are the um, one of the largest, I think we are the largest producer of programs that you see on public television uh, stations across the country. And we are the producers of iconic programs such as American Experience, very pertinent for this evening, Frontline, Nova, Masterpiece, lots of programs for kids, and the ever popular Antique Roadshow. And um, we're also sponsored by PBS Learning Media, which is where you're going to find a lot of the resources that we reference um, during this session. PBS Learning Media, if you're not already familiar with it, um, is a free site offering thousands of resources for K-12 across the curriculum, but we are very strong in social studies. You are welcome to browse the site without signing in, but we encourage you to do so. And if you do, then you can have full access to the functionality of the site. Uh, where you can download resources, save them to folders, have your students save their work, um, et cetera. New content is being added to the site all the time. And by virtue of uh, registering for this conference, you will be part of our email list and you'll get notified of other events and new content that's coming uh, to the site. I am joined this evening and thrilled uh, to be joined by Sue Wilkins, who is the Director of Social Studies Curriculum and Instruction at GBH Education. Sue is a veteran social studies teacher and the former Education Director of the International Museum of World War II from in Natick, Massachusetts. And we're also joined by Sheila Sloan here um, dressed as Lucretia Mott for an event at her school. And Sheila teaches high school. She's been doing it for I think 18 years now at Pueblo West High School in Pueblo, Colorado. And we're thrilled to have her here also. Uh, Sue is going to kick things off and go through some of the PBS Learning Media resources that are drawn from the American Experience program about McCarthy, which was on, um, that was broadcast uh, earlier this year. And uh, then Sheila is going to come on and give some very innovative teaching strategies and tips about teaching the content of McCarthy and also um, using some of the resources that um, Sue refers to. And then I'll come back on for a little bit for some final remarks. We are recording this session, and um, I mentioned that already, excuse me, and we're going to um, send out the recording link along with links to other resources tomorrow in a follow-up email, or it may come out Friday. Sometimes it takes us a couple of days. But I did put in the chat a link to a resource document where I've started to note lots of the links to the resources that we're gonna be referring to. So you can um, access that document there and, um, and then follow along. And I'll also share the slides. That link will be in the email that comes out um, tomorrow or Friday. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I wanna welcome everybody and thank you for tuning in after what I'm sure has been a long day for you. Um, my role this afternoon is really to introduce you to the resources that we developed at PBS Learning Media based on the American Experience film. Uh, this film was originally aired uh, back in January of, of 2020, which now seems like a lifetime ago. 
Um, and it is now currently streaming on AmericanExperience.org. So you can go there and watch the entire two, two hour film uh, if you choose to do that. Um, in preparing for this webinar and reviewing our resources and, and reviewing the film, it really struck me, uh, you know, the connections between this time period in history and uh, the current, current period we find ourselves in. Um, and a couple of themes that jumped out at me and I think uh, Sheila might speak to as well is, you know, the, the sort of the fragility uh, and the resilience of, of democratic institutions and the role that citizens really have to play in our democracy. Um, another theme is, is, is certainly highlighted in the film and in our resources uh, is the role and the power and the influence of the press. And then also uh, the film highlights and the title reflects, you know, these periods in American history of uncertainty and change and fear and that at times these are opportunities for demagogues and agitators to sort of come to power and exert influence. And, um, and so I just, I thought it, wow, what a, what a timely film uh, and for this webinar as well. Okay, uh, next slide, Carolyn, thanks. So we decided um, that we are going to, that we were going to pull out basically three resources, three topics, three themes from the film. And I'm gonna walk you through, uh, through these. Um, you see them uh, here on this slide. Um, we basically, PBS Learning Media, you know, we understand that teachers don't have to, usually have the time to show one or two hour films. So what we do is we excerpt much shorter clips, no longer than six minutes uh, from the film. And then we, we organize them uh, around an essential question, which, which I'll be showing you, and package them for easy use in your classroom. Or given you know, the current situation many of you find yourselves in, um, easy use for your students to watch at home. Okay, so we can go on. Okay, so this uh, first resource, re resource, excuse me, and these do, um, uh, I am gonna address these in sort of chronological order. This resource highlights the connection between the Great Depression and growing American support for communism. And while students may understand, I think the disillusionment with the capitalist system that many Americans experienced as a result of the Great Depression, I think they're less familiar with the attraction of communism and the increased membership in the American Communist Party. And this, this film clip really does highlight that. This resource also addresses the fact that in the 1930s and into World War II, Soviet agents had infiltrated the highest levels of US government. There were agents in the White House, in the Treasury Department, in OSS, which was the precursor to the CIA, in the State Department. And the estimates are um, that are mentioned in the film are that there were 75 active agents working in US government agencies. So I think knowing this context, uh, students will better understand why McCarthy's claims about communist infiltration of the State Department. And again, remember, he doesn't make these until 1950, um, but they gain traction. They, they're rooted in this longstanding concern that there were communists in America and communist agents in the federal government. Um, I've just shown you here a screenshot of the support materials that accompany this resource. Uh, we have teaching tips, which really are for you, the teacher, but can be modified and distributed to students in this at-home learning environment. There's a timeline that we created to go along with the McCarthy resources that integrates both domestic and foreign events that I think are, are relevant to the story here. And then a list of key vocabulary terms that again, uh, you could have your students, you could give to your students, maybe in a Google Doc or something like that. Okay, next slide. All right, so this next uh, resource is all about the famous speech, well, now famous speech in Wheeling, West Virginia, um, where McCarthy first makes his claims that there are you know, communist agents in the State Department. Uh, what I love about what the film does with this is that it's not, they do not show you that speech, but rather what they do is they focus on who McCarthy was at this point in his political career. And how was it that this speech in Wheeling, West Virginia, of all places, to a women's Republican club 
uh, be becomes the beginning of what we now know as uh, McCarthyism. And the, the video does a really great job of, of putting the speech in a broader context um, so that you, know, you can understand again, why is there this sense of fear, this sense that America seems to be losing everywhere. So they talk about you know, China falling to the communists, Soviets getting the atomic bomb, uh, you know, um, uh, communist forces in Eastern Europe, Cold War tensions generally. They domestically talk about Alger Hiss and uh, his perjury conviction um, for being a Soviet spy. So all of this is you know, deeply, deeply unsettling. And McCarthy comes along with a pretty simple answer for why this is all happening, why America is losing out. And it's, you know, it's traitors, right? It's a simple answer. It's something that people uh, seem to gravitate towards. And then on a more practical level in this uh, clip, um, you learn that at this speech, there is an Associated Press, a local Associated Press reporter who writes a story about what, what he says, and that gets picked up nationally. So in this next um, slide, we're gonna, I'm just gonna show you the first minute and a half or so, so you can get a sense of what this film's about. No offense to Wheeling, West Virginia, the person who gets sent there to talk is the person at the bottom of the totem pole. Joe McCarthy's Senate career from 1946 until 1950 is one of repeated failure. No one is expecting him to win re-election. So what is most extraordinary here is that the most important speech in some ways of that generation is given in a place where there is a sense by the people who sent him there that nobody really cares what he has to say or is going to listen very hard. The expectation was that McCarthy was going to give a standard boilerplate speech that you give to uh, you know, Republican constituency. In Wheeling, West Virginia, they really weren't sending him there to make headlines. He comes out and says that there are 205 communists in the State Department. Well, that's electrifying. It's so electrifying that people are almost distracted from the question of who these communists are, whether they actually exist, why does McCarthy know this and other people don't. It's, in a way, a kind of brilliant speech. We are the most powerful country in the world. We're the most influential. Great, so that just gives you a sense of uh, what that clip is about and uh, the integration of, I think, fairly well-known historians at, you know, into, the, into the narrative that the American experience is, is, is well known for. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Great, this is the third resource uh, that we put together. And um, this contains three different film excerpts, all focused on the role of the press in the rise and the fall of Joe McCarthy. And press here refers to print journalism as well as television, which was the new mode of mass communication at this time. Um, McCarthy successfully manipulated the press. And that's really what the first clip is all about and how the press benefits from McCarthy because you know, his, his stories sell newspapers. Um, and this continues until Edward R. Murrow, the, the quote unquote patron saint of broadcast news takes a bold stand and dedicates a show uh, really to, to critiquing uh, um, what McCarthy has been doing. And that's the second clip. And then in the third clip, the focus is on the Army McCarthy hearings. And the Senate, along with President Eisenhower's approval, decided that they would televise this. And President Eisenhower, uh, as it says in the film, somehow knew that it was one thing to read about Joe McCarthy in the newspaper and quite a different thing to see and hear him on television uh, day after day in your home. And, and he was absolutely right. And that really was the final blow to McCarthy and his committee. All right, and we can go to the last slide. And I just wanted to speak briefly to the fact that we do provide support materials with our resources. 
Um, they're there for you to use or not use. I mean, really, again, the whole idea is to be flexible. Um, the teaching tips come along with an essential, the essential question that we, we built the, the resource around. Um, teacher background information and preparation. Video questions before, during, and after the video that you could easily copy and paste into a document and give to your students uh, so they could watch at home and complete those questions at home. And then taking it further are just suggestions for making connections to the present day. Uh, and I think that's all I need to say because I talked about those other two resources earlier. So um, I hope you are intrigued. I hope you'll go explore. And now it's my pleasure to turn things over to Sheila Sloan. Hello, um, my name is Sheila Sloan and I'm here in Colorado this afternoon or this evening. And um, I uh, live in uh, Pueblo West which and teach at Pueblo West High School. I teach ninth graders and I teach this lesson to ninth graders, these lessons that I'm about to share. But I also teach AP US history um, and I've taught IB world history and I um, am currently teaching a couple of concurrent enrollment classes through the local university, Colorado State University. So um, I have a variety of students, but that's a picture there of our, our school. And um, currently I'm at home. We went um, remote last week. So um, we've been bouncing around here, mostly hybrid and now remote. Um, but it's a real pleasure to be with you all today. And I just wanna talk about how I integrate some of these resources into my own classroom. So um, in the next slide, I basically, when we get to the point of McCarthyism and I, uh, sometimes I feel like I'm on a hamster wheel and I'm, I'm really trying to get a lot of information out um, to my students, but also help them to digest the information. And so at this point, when we get to McCarthyism, um, late 1940s, early 1950s, I, I try to give that context um, to them, the global context um, that Sue was referring to, the domestic context, um, and sort of explain the rise of McCarthyism. They've learned about the first Red Scare, uh, after World War I, and now we're getting into the second Red Scare after World War II, and some of the parallels. Um, so we talk about sort of this idea eventually of a witch hunt and maybe a connection back to Salem and the, with the witch trials there. So I try to have some foundational pieces before I've given them too much specifically about McCarthy McCarthyism. So this is sort of the foundation and the build up to McCarthyism. So I haven't gotten into details yet because I kind of don't want them to know too much specifically about McCarthyism because of the way I introduce it, which sort of is a memorable moment in my classroom. We try to make some memorable moments as we go through the year and this is definitely one of those. So, um, and we talk about the idea um, that that very first slide of the American Experience full two hour movie uh, references in the subtitle, power feeds on fear. And that the idea that, um, and Sue referenced this as well, that the fear is legitimate. And that first clip with the context of communism is the great layer to building this lesson that I teach. And it's so, it's quick, but it's uh, concise. And it gives that context of communism in the 1930s and then builds it up to today, this, this um, notion that there was a desire at certain points in our history to look toward communism when maybe it seemed like the boom and bust cycles of capitalism were too wrenching and when unemployment was at 25% in the, in the Great Depression. So we've got some of this layered background, but not too much specifically about McCarthyism yet. Um, and then additionally, uh, point four there, the, the importance of the free press, um, just kind of talking about what the, the free press embodies. Um, so in the next slide, I, I, I just have a brief timeline that this is basically what I've taught them up to the last thing there, 1950. I haven't done the speech and McCarthyism yet, but this is kind of what they've learned. They've learned that, you know, we We've just ended World War II, that the Manhattan Project has resulted in the development of a super secret project to develop these um, bombs. But, and that even our 
president of the United States didn't even know about the project. Harry S. Truman doesn't know about the, the project. It's so protected. It's so secret. We don't want anyone to know because of this fear of possible spies and, and that this technology, somebody could acquire this. And, and lo and behold, Klaus Fuchs is a, is a spy, a spy on the Manhattan Project. So this is, again, what Sue was saying. There's real cause for fear as the Soviet sphere of influence has, has expanded. And there isn't free of freedom of the press and freedom of speech in that country. And so as they as expand into these, um, you know, I walk through the, all this background here, that this is the background the students have gotten, and maybe a quick refresher before I introduce McCarthyism, that, you know, we've got the, the spy that helps accelerate the development of the atomic bomb in the Soviet Union, this, this British spy who sells secrets to the Soviet Union, who's working in our country. Um, and then the idea that there was, uh, from the PBS uh, video, that there were people that had gotten, you know, involved in, um, in levels of government. So there, there was a genuine concern as the Iron Curtain is dropping and Germany and um, Korea have become Soviet spheres of influence. Um, East Germany is communist uh, and, and uh, North Korea has, has been, uh, has, is part of that you know, communist and Soviet sphere of influence. So, um, so they have all this background and um, the Soviet Union has detonated its first atomic bomb significantly. And in the next slide, um, this next slide integrates beautifully um, with those same kind of th foundational things they had already learned. Um, and now you've got this Joseph McCarthy as being elected to the US Senate. And there's some loyalty issues raised by HUAC and the House Un-American Activities Committee. And so these are all things happening right at the end of World War II and into the early Cold War. The students have learned some of these things. Um, and now the Soviet Union has an atomic bomb and China has become a communist uh, country as well. So the sphere of communism is expanding, the sphere of Soviet influence and now spread of communism is real and people are concerned. So the next slide, all that context, <laughs> a map from um, just showing where this, um, you know, the, the, the size of specifically the Soviet sphere of influence and then you can, also see China as has come under uh, Soviet pressure and Soviet influence and um, so on and so forth. So then we get to the next slide and um, this is where I start to introduce this concept of communism and American sphere ex experience has these resources which again um, are available. So I, I just, the whole package of the clips and the teaching materials and uh, just all the work that PBS does to complement what I wanna do is, is lays great foundation. And in the next slide, um, I basically, this is where I would, would have played the um, appeal of communism, given the kids the context, you know, hey, we did have unemployment at 25%. People were looking for other options. Communism did present an idea. And I, I usually do a poll of my students and uh, they, they, we'll talk about that a little bit in a subsequent sl slide, but with Zoom, which I'm teaching all my classes on Zoom right now, um, with Zoom, I will, will put up a poll and say, you know, is communism, is it illegal to be communist in the United States? And my freshmen, don't really know. They're, they 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 think it's not, but they think it might be. They're, you know, they red scare. I don't know. Is it actually legal? So I ask them this question, and the Zoom polling is instant. Um, and I I really like that idea that the students, even though they're at home, or I've been hybrid, or we're now all remote, and then we could do this in person too. There's a lot of different ways we can do polling, but on Zoom they see that data right away. They see how the students answer. And so they're, it's interactive and I like that. Um, and about 50% of them aren't really think it's illegal. So then we talk about first amendment protections, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom of ideas. And we kind of weave that into communism versus this real concern about Soviet influence and kind of differentiate between those two. Um, and also kind of understanding why people were looking at different ideas um, because in the 1930s, 
there was unemployment and people were struggling. So in the next slide, so this slide is this slide represents the, you know, the, the footage that kind of packages all that in a few minutes um, and gives the visual audio uh, experience without a full dedicated class period to an entire documentary. And I love that. Um, so I do um, ultimately talk about this idea of McCarthyism. And I might talk about this before I do this intro activity, or I might put this maybe a little bit later, but ultimately what I wanna differentiate between is real fear versus real fear exploited. And um, the idea that, that a demagogue can play on those fears for personal, political gain. And, and what that means. So, but I, again, I don't wanna tell them too much specifically about McCarthyism, but that it's this idea of maybe exploiting real fear. So in the next slide, I, um, I, I what I start to do with this introduction um, activity is I talk about McCarthy just a little bit and say that he's a Senator and say that he had been elected in 1946, right after World War II ends. And it looked like he might not be reelected and that second clip really goes into why he's giving the speech in 1950. And that's a perfect place to drop that se second clip in my lesson um, so that I can illuminate why this was so unusual that he would be um, speaking in West Virginia and be basically um, not thinking he's gonna be reelected. And then suddenly this juggernaut where he is uh, in the limelight and in the national news um, and how that happens. So in the next slide, <laughs> this is where I hook the kids onto this feeling of McCarthyism. So, so often when I teach, you know, I have the retrospectoscope. Uh, we know what happened. We know the outcome. I'm teaching the outcome to the students and they're jotting it down and this happened next and then this happened next. But this activity is one of those moments that the students leave my classroom and I think they remember this for a long time. Um, we've built a relationship by the time I'm teaching this. I, I'm very careful about doing this activity, um, but I think it's so important um, that I, I do this activity um, so that they are in the moment in a way. Um, so the way this happens is I meet with my administration and one of the assistant principals has been so great with this. He will be, he's timed to come into my class at the beginning of a class period when we're really about to dig into McCarthyism. So they have a little background, they know a little bit about this, but not too much specifically about McCarthyism. Um, they know who McCarthy is, but it's all, it's, a, it's they, I haven't gone into too much details. So um, the administrator comes into my classroom and delivers a letter to me. And I react, I'm very concerned, and I am told I need to read this letter to the class and that my students um, are going to be required to respond to what's in this letter. And I collect the, I'm, I'm told that I need to collect their responses and that the responses need to be taken down to the main office. And then we'll do a debrief. So, what is going on with this letter and what is happening in Mrs. Mrs. Sloan's classroom? Uh, the letter comes in and in the next slide, this is the con these are the contents of the letter. Um, in the next slide, I read this to my class. It has been brought to the attention, to our attention that students in the freshman class were cheating on history tests. And so I'm reading this and I, I'm very grave when I read this and I, uh, get very serious in my room and it's quiet and I'm reading this out loud and the kids are pretty spellbound and I actually really believe that McCarthyism was such a dangerous time my voice gets a little shaky and it's actually because I feel the intensity as I read this of wanting them to understand some of this intensity so I'm reading the note a note has been placed in your file uh, disciplinary action will be taken if this problem so if Mrs. Sloan's class has a problem there's some cheating and I'm going to be placed and I'm in the middle of this and please instruct students to write down the names of three potential cheaters or students who have been known to cheat in the past and they will be called to the office so the kids are hearing me read this 
I don't like what I'm reading. They don't like what I'm reading, but there's this real fear here. The administration is asking something of us and that they have to report potential with or without evidence potential cheaters. So this is a really powerful moment. It unfolds very quickly. I've explained it three times longer than it actually takes to do this. Um, and then the students uh, have to take out a piece of paper and write something down. This goes many different ways over the years and every way it has been very powerful. In some classes, the students are very quiet and they take out a piece of paper and they write things down. In other classes, students are like, that's, you know, blah, 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 I'm not doing that. And the student reactions are so important, whatever happens. Um, and students will say, well, we're just gonna write, we're gonna write numbers on this and leave this blank, or we're going, or, or, or there's silence. Um, and students do as they're told. And so in the next slide, um, we are, we've, we've gotten to the, the students have, Done, taken out a piece of paper. Some are, you know, saying they're not going to do this. Some are uh, complying. Others are speaking out. Um, the, the class is cannot really imagine that this is happening. Um, and then a student is going to to collect these and take them down to the office. And as the student is at the door, I say, and one more thing: have a seat. And the student gives me the notes back. I visibly tear them everything up so nobody sees anything that anyone wrote, throw it away. And then we do a debrief. And I talk to them about what it means to produce a name, what it means to, do, to feel frightened into producing a name, what it means to make that there was going to be a list of names made of potential cheaters and maybe, and, and again, explaining that cheating is not something we want. Um, and there's a real problem there, but that this is sort of weaponizing that fear to, to get information from people and what that felt like to be caught in that. So in the next, so we talk about what happened with McCarthyism and then we quickly debrief this. So this happens in a, just a couple of minutes because I don't want the students to feel this tension for very long and I want them to understand what just happened. And usually the administrator comes back in and we sit down and we talk about this um, and the students, we go through these questions to debrief like, how did you feel pressure? Did you comply? Did you feel like you had to comply? Did you, what did you, you know, think about this policy that you were, you know, and you're a student and here was an administration, a figure of authority. And so we all talk about this so they understand, you know, we quickly do this and then we um, talk about real fear, fear being used for a, a, some sort of an outcome and then what the idea of a false accusation is and a list that might be made and the students talk about well, what if I was falsely accused, what would happen to my reputation, um, what if there's no evidence and so in just a couple of minutes they get a taste of McCarthyism in a way that uh, just me lecturing about it just doesn't, it doesn't bring that about. And so in the next slide, um, just accompanying um, that uh, issue that we just went through as an introduction to, okay, let's talk about McCarthyism and then we start to really get into it. Then I would show some of the subsequent quip, uh, clips that were listed in the third video and maybe even that second video at that point there too. Um, this, I haven't actually taught this with the new um, McCarthyism video because we went remote right before we were about to teach this lesson. So I didn't actually get to embed these in my lesson. So I'd probably put the, um, the little three minute clips of the second video probably into like after they had seen um, this introductory activity and, and experience this. Um, and then we start to talk about, uh, and these polls, excuse me, I'm jumping ahead in my, in my mind here. Um, I plant these um, questions throughout the subsequent discussion that we have as a class. Um, and, and we look at the video, we look at the power of the press, we look at the benefits of the free press, we look at the business side of the free press, excuse me, and um, we talk about that second question there. How do these companies make, you know, make money? How do they stay 
afloat and that they have to sell newspapers. They have to sell advertising. There has to be an audience for it. And bad news, um, controversial news does sell so that the press can be at kind of odds with itself at times because they want to make a living, but they also want to tell the truth. And so in, in history, sometimes this hasn't always um, lined up real well. So um, the importance of a free press and then the realities that a press has to make money and how sometimes that comes in conflict. And, and these PBS clips do a great job of connecting those dots. So in the next slide, um, I do a quick, um, we, we talk about um, the third polling question there, uh, First Amendment protections. We have a dis discussion on this um, as we move into, our classes are um, an hour long. So we have that first activity where the students are um, having the letter delivered. That's a few minutes. We have the debrief, that's about 10 minutes. Then we can get into the discussion about protections um, and we talk about the constitution and issues that McCarthyism raises as we watch these clips um, of McCarthy. And then um, how do we balance all of these issues of freedoms um, and also affording people due process and also understanding the business side of the press. So we're talking about these issues and then, um, and how do we square all this? In the next slide, um, uh, just a reference again to the, the rise and fall of, of McCarthy and embedding that into that, that classroom day. Um, and, and they see how he operates and how the press because there's a new medium out there. We talk about television and how this new medium, in addition to what they might see um, in clippings, news clippings in the theater in the 1950s, there's now television as well as newspaper and radio and how controversy does sell. And Joseph McCarthy is a magnet for the press. He's got new revelations every day. He's making accusations that are shocking and the press is spellbound and they are taking it all in. And so they're, um, the ratings are going up and the, the audience is growing. And, and this issue of McCarthyism and the concerns about Soviet sphere of influence has, is being successfully weaponized to help McCarthy, you know, gain reelection. So um, the students can see this through the clip. And then in the next um, slide, um, we just talk again about, in this conversation about constitutional protections, um, the foundations and background of our free press, um, the concept of, you know, telling the truth, how important it is to tell the truth, um, how important a press is for promoting checks and balances, promoting transparency and accountability, and, you know, go, going through that First Amendment so that they're really solid on this. And then what I do is, um, in the next slide, I give the students an opportunity to, um, talk about these demands on the press as a group, as a whole class, and to share their thoughts on these different demands on the press that coalesce with the clips from um, the uh, role of the press in the three different segments um, that PBS is providing us. And then um, the ethical demands, the economic demands, the political demands. Um, and then this concept of McCarthyism, how does that all fit together? And then in the next slide, um, with this discussion, I um, use breakout rooms. I don't know if, if you all have access to breakout rooms in the platform that you use if you're teaching remotely, but um, my use of breakout rooms has expanded dramatically. Um, I'm, I'm doing a game right now <laughs> in breakout rooms. We're fighting World War I. We're doing a simulation of World War I in breakout rooms and the whole group and negotiations and alliances and all sorts of things. Well, for this, I this fits well to remote teaching as well right now. Um, taking these four questions and in the classroom, you can do 
live and in person, just dividing the class into four groups um, or groups of four to five students, depending on how many students you have, if you have 30 or 20, you know, four to five to a group, and then have them talk about these questions that we've been kind of chewing on as a class, break them into smaller groups, and then have them discuss, create a Google Doc, um, and present back to the class after a few minutes of discussion specifically on these three, four questions here. So, um, and that works really well and then bringing them back together. Um, to wrap up the class period, and this may fall into a second day, um, but I try to, I, I do not have much time to teach McCarthyism, so it's usually within one class period. Um, but if we run over into a second day, I, I, I always like to wrap it up with, well, what happened and how this fear was unleashed, how it spread, how it was magnified by the press, and then ultimately ended in many ways by the press as well as President Eisenhower. Um, and then ultimately what happens with the censure of Joseph McCarthy. Um, so that is how I spend a day, maybe a day and a half with my students on McCarthyism. And the lesson just is so powerful. But these are some other things that I teach as well, along with McCarthyism. And um, you may use these resources too. Um, I try to do about a game a day in my classroom because I, I, I do lecture, but I think they learn so much if they can do a game or they can do something hands-on every day and break up that, break up all that talking from Mrs. Sloan. Um, so, um, the, one of the things that I like to do to introduce the Cold War, and sometimes I use this for World War II as well as the red and green game. And this is a game that we play that basically is we can all work together or we're gonna, some of us are not gonna make it. And um, so we use the, I use this red green game to introduce either World War II or the Cold War. I think it works better with the Cold War. Um, but the idea of, we got, for example, in the Cold War, these nuclear weapons, are we gonna, if we play this game right, we're all gonna survive. But if we go against each other, we try to gain too much over the other group, um, we're not, you know, there's not gonna be really any winner. So um, we play this red game, red green game to introduce the Cold War or World War II. And then I also, when we're talking about the late 40s and into the early 1950s, once the Soviet Union is getting the atomic bomb in 1949, how the duck and cover drill comes about. And uh, we watch Bert the Turtle, and I don't know if we can play any of that. Um, sure, let's do it, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And maybe you've played this too. Um, Hi, I'm Dr. It. Amy Killen. I have my own medical practice, and Oops. I've been Excuse using Doodly now for second. a few weeks to create. <laughs> and, um, my students just are, I think it's just fun to play. Bert the Turtle is just fun, it's classic. If you're teaching history, you've probably seen it maybe as well. There was a turtle by the name of Bert, and the turtle was very alert. When danger threatened him, he never got hurt. He knew just what to do. He ducked and cover. Okay, yeah, it goes on from there. But that's kind of get the idea, but I we use that and I talk about, you know, this idea of these drills that were happening in the schools during the Cold War. And um, I like to get my students moving. And so we actually do a duck and cover drill. And I, um, I talk about we talk about, well, is your desk really going to, you know, protect you if there's a nuclear bomb and, and we talk about the, um, you know, why they why they were promoting this and, and some of the the background behind this, but then we we do a little bit of a duck and cover, and they've done some of that with tornado drills anyway. But um, we we do in class one, and just to kind of um, break up the the little lecture, the the day I I we time it, and um, and then we're sort of acknowledging that if there is of course a nuclear attack, and you're within this certain you know, window, you're not gonna, this is not gonna protect you at all, but we do time it and there's a competition with the other classes. So that's just something I try to do to kind of keep the kids moving and thinking and also, um, you know, thinking how how much is this really gonna protect me if there's a nuclear attack? And, um, and so we talk a little bit about that. And then um, another thing that I use to introduce the Cold War is uh, we play Name That Tune and I, um, there's a song here, if we wanna play that, that's great too. Um, 
we play Mission Impossible and we uh, and the kids are in competition who can figure out what the song We've is. We've been making joy for over 100 on, years. Um, so the Ford built for the holiday yeah. sales event begins now with the best deals of the season. Lease escape for as low as $199 a month or get zero for 60 plus up to 5250 total cash on select SUVs. And Sedona is just where it was Little Hollywood. Um, it was a place where movies, Westerns were uh, filmed. Um, and um, so he's referencing that uh, time period of the Hollywood, Little Hollywood, and sort of this, also this era of the blacklist. So these are some songs. I, I have a list of songs that I like to play just to kind of introduce some of these topics, get the kids moving, get them thinking. Um, these Cold War era, uh, entertainment programs um, and also issues that were raised uh, during this time. So try to liven up uh, the classroom and have some some fun moments in there. So and then the movie, The Atomic Cafe. And um, if you're familiar with that, I, I actually spend a class period showing the Atomic Cafe. It's a fantastic resource. Just love that. Uh, it really talks about the beginning of the Cold War and the end of World War II and sort of this, the climate in which uh, propaganda was was used to shape public opinion in this country and around the world. And, and it, I think it's a very powerful um, primary source of clips of, it's entirely clips of um, advertising and news clips from the time period of the early Cold War. And then the last thing I would mention is uh, we do a, a, a dropping of the atomic bomb trial. Um, we fictionally put tr President Truman on trial for the dropping of the atomic bomb. My students pick sides um, and they gravitate toward whether, you know, they, they think we they defend the idea of uh, dropping the atomic bomb or they prosecute the idea of uh, dropping the atomic bomb. And dozens and dozens of primary sources there. Um, so this is really more just a set of extension activities that I also do as I teach the end of the World War II and into the Cold War. But we ran this Truman on trial on Zoom <laughs> this spring and it was great. I mean, it wasn't the same as being in person, but we we, we were able to run a mock trial on Zoom. And, and I was, I think it was in, fun for the kids um, a little flat because it's not the same as being in the, in person, but helps to um, in this time where they're remote. So, and that's a little taste of my classroom. <laughs> uh, wonderful, Sheila. Thank you so much. There are so many ideas here. Um, I tried to capture uh, many of the links from the resources as well as these outside uh, sources that Sheila referred to in a, um, uh, a document of, um, well, we call it a resource document for, the, for this webinar. And I posted a link to that in the chat box. Um, I'm, I, that's a living document that I'm gonna be adding to, but you'll get the link to that also in the follow-up email that we send out uh, tomorrow or Friday. So thank you, uh, Sheila, um, wonderful. Uh, um, just just wonderful and, and so rich with ideas. Um, this is just a reminder that the resources uh, that Sue introduced you to and Sheila referred to are available free of course on PBS Learning Media, which is a co-production between PBS and GBH. Thousands of resources on the site for K-12, lots for social studies. We wanted you to also, um, understand and browse the site and look at other collections beyond the McCarthy resources, which you will find, um, uh, you can search on the site by the word, just the keyword McCarthy, or you can go to the American Experience collection on PBS Learning Media and find them that way. There's also a collection of frontline resources, very powerful uh, current topics that of course we're all talking about now related to politics and immigration, et cetera. Uh, there's a collection called the um, Calderwood Writing Course, and it's uh, six interactive lessons around a US history topic that stress writing, use a lot of primary sources, 
Students are, um, this, these can be self-paced or assigned in pairs or groups, or, or you can assign pieces of them. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, that's one collection I want to call attention to. And also Life During World War II, which is very rich with primary sources and um, artifacts. The Pilgrims, very timely, is, was an American experience uh, production, and we have lots of resources on the site. Those are, in fact, some of the most popular across the whole website. And The Great War was another American experience production last year, and we have resources from that program also, very similar to the work we did with McCarthy. I wanted to give a shout out to The Vote which was a uh, four hour documentary, American Experience documentary that was broadcast this summer for the anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And you can go to the American Experience website and stream the full four hours if you'd like. Um, I'm looking for my, <clears throat> my mouse right now, which has disappeared. So I can advance the slides, but I think I'll just keep on talking. Uh, let's see here. Okay, here we go. Um, these are just some of the resources from the vote that you'll find on learning media. And um, we have a webinar that's coming up. In fact, Rich Cairn, who is on the call today, I don't know if he's still here, will be one of the presenters along with a high school social studies teacher in Boston and a professor at Wellesley. Um, and also Sue Wilkins, Teach Diverse Sources with Primary Sources and Artifacts. And that's coming up in December. We'll send you out the recording link for that shortly after uh, Thanksgiving in an email. Uh, we record all of our webinars and we post them on the Education, GBH Education YouTube page. And you'll find the recording to this on there um, at the end of the day tomorrow or on Friday. We're very active in social media. We invite you to follow us, please. And uh, again, I'm Carolyn Jacobs with GBH Education, and we thank you very much. And I also wanted to acknowledge um, the um, extraordinary effort of the um, NERC team to bring this virtual conference to fruition and for having us be a part of it. So thank you. Um, to the whole team there. You're welcome to email me if you have any questions or comments or want to get in touch with one of the presenters. And um, I wish you all well, uh, good health, a happy Thanksgiving in whatever shape it takes, and uh, hope to see you and connect with you on other events. So I'll keep the chat box open for another minute or two. And um, Let's see, a uh, question from Sue Weaver. I attended the vote webinar on November 4th. Was there a Google Doc with links for it? I don't have it if someone could share. Yes, sure, Sue, I will. Yes, there was a resource document. We typically put that in as a link in a follow-up email, but maybe that got sidetracked to you. So we'll uh, take care of that. Uh, all right, thanks again to Sheila and Sue, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, we're gonna sign off now and uh, wish you well. Thank you.